Thank you. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, I am Mallory Smith. Like you said, I'm the clinical director of a few of our locations for Continuum Behavioral Health. I have been in the field of applied behavior analysis since 2005, and I'm here to talk to you about understanding assessments and the needs of your loved ones. Um, I know this is listed as a lecture, but I generally prefer to have dialogue and back and forth interactions with my um, people that I'm presenting to. So please feel free to reach out, ask questions, offer comments as we go along. And I do want to get to know you guys a little bit. Um, so who of you are parents of children or adults who have a disorder of the corpus callosum? Okay. Who of you might have a disorder of the corpus callosum? No. Who are you are professionals in the world of treating people with a disorder of the corpus callosum? Or might be both. <laughs> awesome. What brings you here? You're a parent. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming to my presentation about assessments, and I'm hoping this will help you get a better understanding of what assessments can do for you. So throughout this presentation, what I am hoping you will learn from me today is to be able to identify all the potential areas of need that you might want to assess for your child or your loved one. You're going to gain a basic understanding of several assessments that are common in both diagnostic and um, understanding present levels of development. You'll be able to identify who can perform these assessments and how you're going to be able to access them. I hope that you learn why these assessments are important. And you're going to learn what is typically used in applied behavior analysis to provide some information and guidance for intervention. So we're going to discuss the two main types of assessments today. Neurological evaluations, where the goal is that we want to assess and identify the strengths and weaknesses across multiple areas of development. And then you're also going to learn about skills-based assessments. The goal of a skills-based assess assessment is to provide kind of a present level of functioning and then to help guide you and assess growth over time. So we're going to take a deeper look into each. But before we do, I want to get an understanding of who of you have had evaluations completed on your children, on your loved ones. Yes, a lot of you, right? Yeah. Most of you have had evaluations done. Did you find those evaluations particularly helpful? Mm, maybe a little. Where are they now, those evaluations? In a drawer? Yeah, <laughs> right. So this is what we see a lot, is families have evaluations done, and then they just sit in a drawer somewhere and they're not being used because you're not being told how to use those evaluations and where to go from there. And that's what I'm hoping to help you with today. So we're gonna take a deeper look first into the neuropsychological assessments. We're gonna look at this first because this is often the first step after a diagnosis or these assessments are used in diagnostic evaluations. So what typically happens is a neuropsychologist is going to examine a person's intellectual, uh, intellectual abilities, their learning style, and their personality traits. They're going to use the information that they get from uh, examining those to see how they interact and affect a person's development. These evaluations can help clarify diagnoses and provide more information about general strengths and weaknesses. So these are some of the subdomains that are generally assessed with a neuropsychological assessment. Intellectual level, often these um, evaluations will provide you with an IQ test or an IQ score. They're going to assess memory, attention, um, organization, organization, and judgment planning. So we're looking at big picture evaluation. These are some of the commonly used assessments that are given when diagnosing disorders or in helping clarify those. So you have the Wexler, the Kaufman, the Connors, the Basque, the ADOS, and the CARS. And we'll go into a little bit more depth on each of these, but as we move through, who here has identified an assessment or an evaluation that their loved one has had off of this list? Yes. Excellent. So let's first talk about the Wexler. The Wexler is an intelligence test. 
measuring a child's intellectual ability across the five cognitive domains listed above. Verbal comprehension, visual spatial index, fluid reasoning, which really looks at um, taking in information and looking at problem solving, um, and that's kind of what goes into fluid reasoning, is that logical understanding and problem solving. Working memory and processing speed. This assessment is typically used for children from 6 to 16 years of age. And there are a preschool scale and an adult scale used, but most often you're going to see the um, standardized scale. It can generate a full scale IQ test. And so it's typically used in a battery of evaluations that most people get when they are looking to assess for a diagnosis. It's very common. In addition to the Wexler, the Kaufman is a very common assessment. The Kaufman is, fairly, is used to fairly assess children of a variety of backgrounds with a lot of diverse um, languages and um, uh, socioeconomic classes. So what's great about the Kaufman is that it really allows you to be confident that you're getting a very clear picture of your child's cognitive abilities even when language barriers are in place or cultural differences might affect the score of your assessment. So if you're someone who is a second language learner and you go in to get an evaluation done, this is an assessment that you might ask for instead of a Wexler because it's more in tune to people who have language barriers. It helps you get insight into how a child receives and processes information and helps pinpoint cognitive strengths and weaknesses. It's usually used for ages 3 through 18. Um, the next assessment that we're going to talk about is the Connors third edition. So the Connors is often used for school age children. They're really looking at identifying the symptoms associated with ADHD in school age children and looking at some of those comorbid diagnoses that go along with ADHD. So often when you have a child that presents with ADHD symptoms, you're also looking for those common uh, comor um, comorbid diagnoses. So things like anxiety, depression, op um, oppositional defiant disorder, and then conduct disorders. This assessment is often used in the educational system. So you'll see a lot of school-based psychologists use these assessments in addition to um, SLPs. This assessment is great because it really helps you plan and monitor that intervention over time. And it is used for children ages 6 through 18. And then the BASC-3. The BASC-3 is a behavioral assessment for children. It, is used a tri it uses a triangulation method to get at the behavioral and emotional needs of a child. So there is a self-assessment, there is a parent assessment, and a teacher assessment. And it's really great when you can get all three assessments performed to really understand the whole picture of the um, loved one that you're assessing. Oftentimes we do get the parent and the, and the teacher assessment, but people forget to include the self-assessment or think that their child isn't capable of that. Um, but as much as we can, we really love to get that because it helps that child also reflect on their own needs in terms of their behaviors and emotions. It helps differentiate between hyperactivity and attention problems. And this is one of the assessments that's often used in schools as well because it falls under IDEA and it's used for developing behavior intervention plans in schools and individualized education plans. So this spans from ages 2 to 25. Then we have the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. The ADOS is the standardized assessment used in diagnosing autism spectrum disorders. And we know that a lot of times some of the presentations that people with disorders of the corpus callosum have can present very much like autism. And there's a lot of people talking about some of the spectrum and there is a wide spectrum of presentations in disorders of the corpus callosum. So the ADOS can be helpful in picking up on some of those differences. Also, some of the clusters of skills. So you might have a lot of skills in one area, but lack some skills in another area of development. So the ADOS is divided into four modules. 
you were only given one module as an individual. The first module is for students who are young, non-fluent, or non-verbal speakers. The second module then has people, um, assesses people who are fluently or close to fluently speaking. And then the third module is for full fluent speakers. And then the fourth module is for adolescents and adults. So it tailors up based on the language ability. It comes in a kit, or people make their own kits, um, but it assesses a wide variety of skills. And then we have the CARS. So the CARS has become one of the most widely used empirically validated autism assessments. It's proven especially effective in discriminating between people on the autism spectrum disorder and those with more severe cognitive de deficits. It utilizes three clinical forms to be more responsive to those differences. So the standardized, standardized version is used for clients six and younger who experience communication difficulties or below average IQs. The high functioning form is used for the verbally fluent children ages six and older. And then there's a parent questionnaire form. Each of these forms generally takes about 10 minutes to complete. And so that makes it really efficient for families when they're looking to get an assessment done. Great. So now we've gone through some of the neurological evaluations. And we talked a little bit about the beginning, for those of you who are just joining, about what happens after a neurological visit. And I asked some of you where your evaluations are currently. And for those of you who weren't here, who has had a loved one who has had a neurological evaluation done, performed? Okay, yeah, so all of you. <laughs> where are those assessments now? In a drawer? <laughs> in a filing cabinet? Yeah? How often do you look at or reference it? Often? Yeah. Did you find it particularly helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you needed it to receive a service or to get support, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about a different type of assessment, the skills-based assessment, and what it can do for you and ways that it can often be more helpful in your day-to-day -day life than a full-scale neurological assessment. When I think about the differences between these two, I think about neurological assessments or evaluations being our big picture. They're giving you this large global picture of your child's cognitive ability, it gives you a big picture of their overall social um, impact, and you're looking at kind of what can be overwhelming for a lot of families at times, because you don't live big picture. You often live in those day-to-day -day moments of, I need to know what my child can do. And this doesn't really tell you what your child can do. While very valuable for that big picture, it's really great to combine these with skills-based assessments to understand what it is your child can do and is doing currently. So that is where we're moving next. So skills-based assessments. These are often used in applied behavior analysis to glean present levels of functioning and then to be able to measure growth over time. So this is what we use in order to be able to say, this is what your child can currently do and here's where we're going and here's how we got there. And look, they made it to this next point on their roadmap. And I'm hoping that this is what you can find for your children as well. So some of the areas of focus for skills-based assessments are those daily living adaptive skills. Can they brush their teeth? Do they wash their hands after they go to the bathroom? Um, are they showering independently? Do they you know, make their own coffee in the morning? Um, Behavioral concerns, are they able to regulate when upset, when told no, um, do they respond accordingly, or are they having tantrums? Um, are they rigid in their thoughts, or do they get stuck in their thoughts? 
Um, communication, both receptive and expressive. So receptive being, do they understand what you're asking of them, what you're telling them? If you say, go get your shoes from your room and bring them back downstairs, are they able to follow those instructions? And that expressive communication. So if you say, hey, how was your day? Are they able to say, I had fun? And then executive functioning. So again, being able to put multiple things together. Um, go upstairs, grab your shoes, come downstairs and get your backpack, let's go. And being able to remember all the steps of that and do that fluently. Play skills, which is hugely important for all people, young and old, to be able to learn how to play and find joy and leisure skills in their life. Self-management, sticking to a task, monitoring their own emotions. Social skills, connection is one of the biggest things that we have across the world in our lives, and we know these last two years with COVID have impacted that a lot. And we're seeing big effects on children's social skills. So there are a lot of people who are needing assessments geared just in that area. And then imitation skills, learning through observation. Some of the most common skills-based assessments that we use in applied behavior analysis are listed here. The ABLES are the AFLES, the Early Start Denver model, the Essentials for Living. We use practical functional assessments and FBAs, which is a functional behavioral assessment. Um, peak relational theory. We have the pervasive developmental disorder behavior inventory, social responsiveness scale, the VB map, and the Vineland 3. So we're gonna briefly talk about each of these as well, just like we did with the neurological evaluations. The VB map. So the VB map is a widely used skills-based assessment across behavior analysis. It is often used for people who are um, between the ages of three, two or three, um, and 18, um, but you can continue to use it at different times depending on your learner. The main components of the VB map provide a baseline level of performance and then a direction for intervention. So you're immediately taking the information that you got and putting it to use. And it assesses across these three main areas of development. So they're looking for the milestones assessment, which, which lets you know what you ch your child can do. So can your child request 25 items throughout a day? Can they um, use joint attention to get your attention when they want something. Um, can they label items and objects in their everyday life? Then they have the barriers assessment. And I love this assessment in particular about the VB map because it tells you the areas where your child shows difficulty or where you might need to change the way that you're teaching. So the barriers, are, barriers assessment will tell you if your child has a prompt dependency. So you're teaching them and you're modeling and you're showing them over and over, but you can't ever get them to do it independently. That's good information for you to have if you're, if you're showing signs of prompt dependency. Or a deficit in scanning. So you might have several items out in front of your child and you're like, grab your shoes and the shoes are on the right side, but your child's only looking right in front of them and they never see what's on the right side. That's good information for you to have so that you can adjust your instruction to help with those barriers. And then the transition assessment. So that starts to combine the milestones and the barriers, or barriers assessment so that you can identify whether a child is making that meaningful progress over time. This is an example of the graph that goes along with the VB map. What's nice about this is you have a great visual representation of what your child is and can doing, uh, is and can do, and then the areas where you still need to provide instruction. So over time, you fill in the boxes with the color that lines up with the date of your assessment. So each time you use a new color, it allows you to see that growth over time. This is an assessment that is very similar to the VB map called the ABLES R. <laughs> the ABLES R is a language assessment. It's a comprehensive review of over 500 skills across 25 domains of development. It really focuses on language, social interaction, self-help. It includes some academic skills and motor skills. 
This is most typically um, used for children who are between the ages of two and six. Most of the skills on the ABLES you would like to see a child complete before entering kindergarten or within their kindergarten year. This is an example of an ABLES R graph. So you can see it's, it's set up very similarly to the VB map graph where you have the first date of assessment being the colored, uh, the colored boxes in yellow. So when you first complete them, you color all the boxes in that they're able to complete that first year. So then every year that you reevaluate, you change the color and you can see that growth over time. Each, indiv each individual box represents a subskill that you're assessing. So for example, in visual performance, it might be that the first box is the child can complete five interlocking pieces of a puzzle. Then the second box might be that the child can complete up to 12 interlocking pieces of a puzzle. And it subscales up from there in um, development so that you can see that progress over time and that they're able to reach those higher level skills in each subdomain. The Early Start Denver model has been around for a really long time. I love this model because of the premise that it starts with. So the heart of the ESDM model is the empirical knowledge base of the infant-toddler learning and developmental principles. We know that infant-toddler learning is strongly influenced by the quality of the relationship between the child and their caregivers. So the Early Start Denver model really relies on that in the ways that it assesses. It uses sensitive and responsive strategies every, that are used every day within learning opportunities. We're really looking at a play-based intervention. And the assessment is around two hours. But again, because it is such a sensitive and responsive interaction, it very much feels like play for each of the children that are performing this assessment. And because it is focused on that infant and early development, it generally only goes up to 48 um, months. But we have had people who have continued to use that um, for a few years after that as, as children continue to develop. Then we have the apples, the assessment of functional living skills. So as you can see in the graphic here, the apples has six components of the assessment. It has the basic living skills, it has home skills, community skills, school-based skills, independent living, vocational or work skills, and all of those go into this comprehensive criterion referenced assessment. However, sometimes you can use these each individually. So you could combine and tailor this assessment to what is a priority for your learner. It can be a great tracking system and a guide for teaching children, adolescents, and adults the essential living skills needed to achieve the most success. In addition to the apples, we have the essentials for living. The Essentials for Living is great because the whole mission is to moderate, is to provide people with severe disabilities an assessment that is both evidence-based and allows for dignity within the assessment process. It really provides that comprehensive assessment for people with moderate to severe disabilities across the essential eight skills needed for daily success. So they determined that the essential eight skills are being able to make requests, getting your wants and needs met. Are you able to ask for the things that you want and need? Waiting after making those requests, accepting removals, completing those required tasks, those daily living skills, accepting no, following directions related to health and safety, completing daily living skills, and then tolerating skills related to health and safety. So this really comes up with things like being able to accept no when your child asks to go to McDonald's because that's not what you're doing at you know one in the morning when they've woken up and they want McDonald's. Or you're wanting them to brush their teeth and being able to move through that process. Or cross the street or being able to fix their own food for lunch that day, but you're wanting to make sure that they're able to be safe in doing that. 
This is a great assessment geared towards those kinds of skills, those adaptive skills. Then we have the PEAK assessment. And PEAK is a relatively newer assessment, but it's really interesting in its model. It goes across four triangles or modules, as you can see in the graphic above. The first triangle stands for the direct training. That is a lot of the prerequisite skills that your children might be lacking. So they're gonna be looking at those foundational skills and building those up so that they're able to move to that next module, which is generalization. So once you have these foundational skills, we want you to be able to use them because if you're not using them, what's the point in having them? So we're gonna start taking them out into the environment, into the community, changing the way that we present it, using new materials when we assess it and when we work on those skills. Then you have equivalence. And that's where you start making associations and correlations between things. And this can be really interesting when you're trying to kind of bridge ideas or thoughts across, um, across a realm of, of categories. And then we have transformation. And this module is all about problem solving. So really looking at that logical brain, that reasoning brain, and then applying that to solve problems. We have the pervasive developmental disorder behavior inventory. This is one of the assessments that gets mandated often by insurances. Um, if you have TRICARE, then you probably are aware of the PDDBI as they require that for access to ABA services. I like to think about this one as a scaled assessment, um, which is why we have the balancing rocks here. It assesses both skill acquisition and problematic or maladaptive behaviors all in one assessment. So you're looking at things like joint attention, pretend play, um, social communication in the skill acquisition side, but you're also getting a good idea of where your loved one might fall on the rating scales for some of their stereotypical behaviors or some of the aggressive or um, fear-based behaviors they may have, some of those social deficits, um, and any of the aberrant language, so um, some of those social communication breakdowns. The social responsiveness scales is one of my favorite assessments. It really allows you to assess the social impairment in natural settings. Parents often complete these assessments, teachers, and they're asked to rate symptoms that they've noticed over a period of time at home and in the environment. The raters evaluate symptoms using a quantitative um, scale, and it gives a nice range of severity. And the total score kind of gives you a good idea of where your child falls across five treatment subscales. It assesses for social awareness, how aware is your child about the people in their environment and what those people are wanting in terms of their interactions with each other. Social cognition, social communication, so are they able to communicate with those people in their environment? Their social motivation, and this is something that we talk a lot about with um, some of our clients with autism because we know that social skills is a deficit for people with autism and often the social motivation is not there. So how do we support people in having the skills that they want to have in order to be social when they want to, while also not pressuring them to be social if that's not a value to them? And then those restricted and repetitive behaviors, restricted interests and repetitive behaviors, and how those can impact your social skills. If all you wanna talk about is Thomas the Train, it can be difficult to make friends with people who are not interested in Thomas. And that happens a lot. So those are some of the areas um, that it focuses on and gives you a nice understanding of where your loved one falls on that range. And then we have the Vineland. What I most love about the Vineland is its age range. You can um, use this to administer birth through age 90. It is a very simple um, assessment to complete. It has a rating scale, it takes about 30 minutes, and it gives you a nice picture not only in aiding a diagnosi uh, diagnosis, but developing those educational and treatment plans. And it is the widest range in terms of age. This is an example of some of the information um, that you'll get after completing the Vineland. So this is a Vineland graph once it's completed. 
and these are the domains that it covers. You can see from the graph that it gives you a total score, a composite of all the domains, but you get to see also where the strengths are. So in this um, particular Vineland assessment, you can see that motor skills are a strength for this client, but their social skills are one of their areas of weakness. So that would help you develop the need for goals around social skills and utilizing motor skills as a strength in how you develop those. So teaching social skills under ways that they can use their strength of motor skills might look like playing baseball or riding bikes with a friend and using that as a way to develop that in intervention. Behavioral assessments. So behavioral assessments are often some of the hardest ones to find and the hardest ones to really quantify. But a lot of what we use and apply behavior analysis are uh, functional analyses and then functional behavioral assessments. The purpose of these is to find the, out what the function of the behavior is. Is the child engaging the behavior in order to access attention? Are they wanting to ask, access escape? Access a tangible like the iPad or their favorite food? Are they wanting to avoid something, uh, an aversive task? They don't want to take a bath tonight. Um, or is it more of an automatic or a sensory response? Or is it a combination of all of those things? And that's something that we are in our field looking more and more into is that nothing really occurs in a vacuum. And a lot of times these functions are synthesized. So it might be that they're wanting access to your attention, but escape from the aversive task. So I don't want to take a bath, but I do want to sit with you on the couch and talk. And so those things are happening at the same time. What these assessments allow you to do is to design a treatment program and teach replacement behaviors that allow the person to access those same functions with responses that will allow them to be more successful. So if a child wants a cookie and they tantrum for the cookie, it's not necessarily clear what they want, and they're not communicating in a way where most people are prone to give them cookies. So we wanna teach ways that they can access that more successfully so that they're getting their wants and needs met more frequently. So this is kind of an overview. If we go to the one before that, Chung, sorry. This is kind of an overview of some of those assessments that I mentioned, in addition to some others that I didn't. We have a whole list of assessments here that can be really helpful in getting you the information that you need to know where your child is currently functioning and then where you might wanna go next. And then this breaks those same assessments down by learner skill level and then the needs of assessment. So you have at the top, if you have an early learner, you have the assessments that are most um, available for those early learners. And then the moderate skill and higher skill level learners. And then you have it by domain below, where if you are just wanting to work on social skills, you can see the ones that are just appropriate for, or most appropriate for social skills. So now that we've gone over some of these assessments, why are they important? Well, especially these skills-based ass assessments, they give you a better understanding of your child's learning style. So again, we talked about with the barriers assessment in the VB map, it lets you know if you have positional bias or if your child has an issue with um, prompt dependency. So you know you need to use ways of fading those prompts so that they're not just waiting for you every time to perform the task for them. It gives you access to services that are government or insurance funded. Um, I know I spoke with a couple of you in the hallway about whether or not um, ABA services are covered by insurance for disorders of the corpus callosum. Unfortunately, insurance is over only covering ABA services for people with an autism diagnosis. Um, but I know that there have been families that have been successful in getting that autism diagnosis in order to access um, ABA services. A lot of the presentations um, of autism and disorders of the corpus callosum are similar. So that is something that you could explore um, in order to get access to more services. 
And then identifying areas of focus and evaluating the progress in those areas of focus over time. So assessment is today's means of modifying tomorrow's instruction. The whole purpose of these assessments is to give you a direction, is to show you where you wanna go and what things to work on next. So just ask, ask for these assessments. Ask for where to go next. You can ask your pediatricians, you can ask psychologists, and you can ask a behavior analyst. When you ask, what should you look for in your evaluator? Well, you want to know what their experience is in assessing people who are the age of your loved one. You want to know what the cost of the evaluation is. Sometimes insurance will cover these evaluations. Sometimes the people performing the evaluations are private pay only. So it's very important to know what the cost will be going in. How much time is going to be spent on the evaluation? What all is included in the evaluation process? How long will it take to have your results? And then will they go over the results with you after? And that's the one that I most I think is most important because you can all read the evaluation. You can all go through and see what it is, but where do you go from there? It shouldn't just go in a drawer. We wanna make sure that you understand and can utilize those assessments to help guide you and how you help your loved one. Preparing for an evaluation day. So when you are trying to get these evaluations and you're setting this up, you wanna make sure that you're setting your loved one up for success. You're gonna schedule this early in the morning. You don't wanna wait until after school when they've been working seven hours in the classroom and then go for an evaluation. They're going to be exhausted. You want them fresh, giving their best effort so that you get a true picture of what they can do. You wanna set expectations for your loved one. You can use social stories or videos or just descriptions of the activities that your child will be doing and what is expected of them. You can utilize supports. If your child has a blanket that they carry around everywhere, let them take their blanket into the assessment. I once performed an assessment on a child with a doll where the doll selected every item that I asked for because the child wouldn't and did not want to separate from that doll. There's no reason to. Use it and let them use it. So coach your evaluator. This is how my child can be most successful. These are the things that makes my child comfortable. And then documents. Bring all the relevant information to the evaluation process so that the person evaluating has all of that information going in. Relevant documents can be the individual education plans, medical records, and then those release forms so that they are also able to collaborate with the other providers providing services for your children. I also recommend that parents bring in a list of questions and concerns. You will always forget all the things that you wanna ask because you go there and you're so focused and your adrenaline's high. So write down those questions, make sure you get your answers. And then apply what you learn. How do we do that? The results of these evaluations can provide helpful insight into the type of methodology that would best fit your child's needs and provide the professionals, teachers, attorneys, and caregivers a way to better understand why your child may be having difficulties in certain areas of development. The evaluations can also provide recommendations for the types of interventions and treatments that may be effective and appropriate. So share that information. Get those assessments and share them. Share them with your teachers, with pediatricians and other health providers, with speech and language pathologists, with physical therapists, with occupational therapists, and with behavior analysts. Does anyone have any questions for me on how to use assessments or any of the specific assessments we covered? Yeah. 
to your evaluator? Yeah. Absolutely, and I totally understand what you mean about the Vineland. Reading those reports at times can be very difficult, and it does have such a wide range that it can seem like a really big gap when you think about it. Um, so it may be that something along the lines of an Essentials for Living or the, um, um, not the VB map, but the, um, I just lost it, the apples, um, might be the best assessment for that. Can you go back to that slide? Yeah. Generally, they're gonna say calendar. So with the ABLES, um, they will often say that it's not appropriate to use over the age of six. Um, but I know that there are professionals that have used it because you're continuing to see growth on that developmental scale. So I think it really does depend on your evaluator, which is a great reason you want to in, you know, have that in, in initial interview with them so that you understand what it is they're looking for and they know what you're looking for. Because no matter what they're looking for, you need to be able to guide them and say, this is the information I want. Can you please perform an assessment that will help me find that information? Those are great questions. Any others? Yes. Yeah, so two things. Um, if you're looking at the big picture neurological assessment, um, I'm not sure if you guys were in here when I went over the Kaufman. Um, but the Kaufman assessment is really great for learners with um, language barriers or second language learners. Um, but for skills-based assessments, Ideally, to get a true picture of what they actually know, the language that they are most comfortable in should be what is used for the assessment process. Because otherwise, you're not assessing what they actually know. Um, and so that can be difficult, but finding an evaluator who will either work with you um, on using the language that they are most familiar with, or who will offer an interpreter um, is always a best option for that. And then bridging those gaps when you can. But again, it's, you know, there could be so much information there that just a language barrier is preventing you from knowing. So we want to make sure we eliminate that as a variable. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, it depends on who's providing the assessment. So that question is always a little bit difficult because there's so many different ranges. Um, for the kind of big picture psychoeducational or neurological assessments, insurances will require you to update those, insurance providers will require you to update those at least every five years. So anything past the five year mark they're gonna say is outdated um, and needs to be reevaluated. Schools, based on the 504 or the individual um, education plan, will complete those every three years. Generally, I would say most behavior analysts are completing anywhere between every six month to yearly um, to see that growth. And you really do have the option of kind of deciding where you fall on that based on how much growth you anticipate seeing. Um, I know a lot of people who who have evaluations that ended right before COVID are particularly looking at those social skills like the SRS um, even before that three-year mark because we've seen such an um, impact from the lack of socialization during COVID on the effect of people and their social skills. 
So it might be a great thing to look at maybe just a social skills assessment or um, using some of the ones like the um, Essentials for Living um, that might give you a good picture of what they're doing currently. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. So how do we like get the immediate decision on the table yet be ready to make changes to what we do know? That's an excellent question. And we see that a lot where people say, He has he has the skills, but he won't do it. He has the skills, but he won't do it. And that's a generalization issue. Um, so what you're going to want to talk about is, you know, yes, he has the understanding, he has the foundational knowledge, but he's not generalizing and applying those skills in his everyday interactions with his friends, um, in his school, his community. Um, one of the best ways that you can get someone to see and look at that is by doing some observations in those settings, um, some data collection in those settings, so that they're able to see firsthand that the knowledge he has isn't being applied there. Mm -hmm. Those are great questions. Absolutely. <laughs> Generalization and application of skills is a really big, especially for people with autism, it is you know, one of the main reasons because they you know, they have so much strength in memorizing skills, memorizing information, and really gaining that initial knowledge, but then that application can be really difficult. And I know I mentioned before, and it's, you know, base, it's how Continuum provides services, um, but we really are client value-based. So there is some difficulty when you have a child who may not be socially motivated to want to use those skills. Yeah. So we want him to be able to have the ability to use them, but we also want to acknowledge someone who might not have that full social motivation, might be an introvert by nature, and not push them to do something that makes them more uncomfortable just because we think they should. So there's a balance there for giving them the skills and letting them use them, but also kind of letting that balance on, on its own. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Any others? Thank you guys so much for coming to my presentation and for all your great questions. Um, at the end of my um, slides here, I do have my contact information. If you guys have other questions about how to access these assessments um, through psychologists, your pediatricians, other behavior analysts, um, you're welcome to reach out to me there. And then our last slide has our Continuum Behavioral Health social media information. Um, so feel free to give us a like and follow, and you can also ask questions there. Yeah. Yes, it will. Yeah. <laughs> that list of assessments. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great resource. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be on the app as well. Yeah. <laughs> I totally understand. It can be useful at times and it can be very frustrating. And I have a lot of families who don't, you know, don't want to look at that assessment. And there are other assessments where we can, you know, assess some of the same things and be able to provide a better picture, a more positive picture at times. Um, but it can be very sensitive to change, so. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, take your list now that you have to your evaluator and say, I want something different. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.